the genome's impression of us would be very interesting if we could find out what that would be. Mm -hmm. Are we messing up? Are, are, are we you know, fulfilling our potential? What does it think of us? What does it see when it looks at us? And that's where, where the potential lies at that level. And it became really clear to us then that something like a neurosis is in several simultaneous states. It's the same information, but it collapses into representation at one or more of these levels. Once we got that, it all started to become clear about how we can solve a great deal of problems, including how do we communicate with the so-called unconscious. Whereas imagination is different because imagination is the fulfillment the movements of potential, our energy and information moves out into the environment when we become continuous, everything agrees and lines up, and then we move on. We're no longer in fantasy. It's worked. And that's the solution to neurosis. Hi everyone. A quick note before we launch into today's video. Applications for CADA 5 of our IPSA professional training course are now open for start in September 2022. If you feel that you have a calling towards depth psychology or psychotherapy and would like to train professionally under Steve and Pauline Richards in psychosystems analysis, then you are more than welcome to apply. We really look forward to reading your application. Check the link in the description and pinned comment for the application webpage. Thanks everyone. Now onto the video. Today's conversation is a part two to the dialectic that I was blessed to share with my mentor, Steve Richards, on synchronicity. If you haven't seen it yet, we recommend either watching it first or adding it to your watch later. The link is in the description. By means of an introduction, I'll draw on an example raised by Steve in this video and in previous videos too. Have you ever seen a clinical philosopher? Surely the answer is no. Philosophy as a modality of inquiry is completely unsuited for therapeutic work, as I'm sure won't raise much disagreement. Science, as in many ways a development on from pure philosophy, in contrast, is more useful here. Biomedicine, the knowledge of anatomy and physiology, the pathogenesis of infectious diseases, and countless more scientific findings have been instrumental in alleviating suffering and improving our quality of life. However, when it comes to working with the lived reality of an individual in their whole context, the scientific method, too, runs aground very quickly. For conditions with a significant psychogenic etiology, Science, as a methodology relying on observation and measurement of controlled experimentation, is not fit purely on its own for an investigation. Human beings are far too dynamic, moment to moment, in the context of the psychosocial world, with an entire autobiographical context, to be suitably boxed in as a statistic and given a reified label. This is not to knock either philosophy or science. As Steve shows in this video, in context, they are both simply, quote, collapsed waveforms, end quote, of perception. Their conclusions about the world, however true, are, nonetheless, limited by the model used to deduce them. For philosophers, they are almost exclusively filtered through the founder's personal myth. We've spoken on this previously on the channel. Scientists are not immune to this either, though their main stimulus for quote-unquote waveform collapse here is the strict framework through which the empiricism is filtered. Brilliant for elucidating observational cause and effect, but not so useful for moment-to-moment -moment modeling of a dynamic human being. In the 1980s, from working clinically, experiencing and witnessing the entirety of the lived reality of the human condition for many years, Steve, together with his wife Pauline, 
developed an original and groundbreaking approach to modelling the human experience. As informational monism, this includes an appreciation of biology, psychology, and the dynamic interplay between both and the environment, as well as being entirely consistent with the clear presentation of such things as synchronicity and the so-called paranormal. Since the 1980s, Steve and Pauline have updated their model in line with advances in genetics, neuroscience, anthropology, physics, field theories, and many other sources of knowledge, and it has stood the test of time as the premier means of relational modelling. When appropriate, we can collapse into biology. The same is true of psychology, but the psychosystems analyst is fully capable of remaining conscious of the appreciation that what they are observing in a single moment is simply a snapshot of the entire dynamic bandwidth of information working through themselves and the person they are helping clinically. Synchronicity, then, is simply another means of informational presentation, linked together via, in the words of Carl Gustav Jung, Unus Mundus. All it takes to see it is to step outside of the perception of the ego. Steve is a depth psychologist with over 40 years of clinical experience, and together with his wife Pauline, the co-founder of the Institute for Psychosystems Analysis. Psychosystems Analysis is the original and groundbreaking development in scientific, systems-based medical holism, synthesized with Jungian-based depth psychology, respiratory psychophysiology, and hypnotherapy. Steve and Pauline have been supported in this endeavour by many notable clinicians, including Dr. Anthony Stevens, Professor Ernest Rossi, Professor George Engel, Dr. Peter Nixon, and by Franz Jung, Carl Jung's only son. In May of 1992, Steve and Pauline made a promise to Franz in his father's home to bring his father's work, Carl Jung's work, into the reach of ordinary people. Jung to live by is a part of that promise. Today's video begins with a comment from our previous dialectic, kicking things off. We really hope that you enjoy. Okay, and Mr. Nomark commented, mind-blowing illumination of some really challenging concepts and the wordless actualities that fuel them. Thank you again for your revolutionary work that reverberates across all levels of the dynamic one. I have not encountered the informational monism. Any chance you could signpost me in the right direction? As a longtime student and practitioner of non-dual teachings and a range of expressions, I'd love to hear your observations and perceptions on Buddhism, Vedanta, ah, and it looks like the comment cuts off there. I'm not entirely sure why. I think it's a glitch on my end. But then you've replied, Steve, hi again and namaste. Pauline and I developed informational monism as a core principle of our work back in the 1980s. I've been involved in Buddhism for 50 years, and it has certainly influenced our work. We'll do more on this topic very soon. Kind of regards, Steve and Pauline. And we will do some, some uh, we'll have a conversation on this stuff right now. So yeah, I, I thought this would be a really nice prompt to, to begin things off with, because in the previous video, we did talk a lot about, although it was mentioned about informational monism, and how potentially we could expand on that, and maybe into deep structure complexes, yeah. meta instincts as well. Yeah, thanks, James. Uh, and of course, thank you to Mr. Nomark as well. Um, it came about for us for two reasons. One was theoretical with respect to what was going on back in the early 1980s and uh, attempting to see why psychotherapy broadly was a kind of Tower of Babel where the different schools wouldn't communicate with one another or couldn't. And that this has been a historical fact. Um, all of the different interpretations, if if any one of them is true, that necessarily negate, negated every other one, and that obviously couldn't be the case. It wasn't so much that there was value in all of them. There was some value in all of them, 
but it was why was it so desiccated? And for us, it boiled down to fundamental principles about how they were conceiving human nature and by extension, the world itself. And the thing that was really obvious was that information, however we eventually decide to define that, moves from different states of representation. And one of those states of representation is everyday work, a day consciousness. And the so-called unconscious is another kind of informational representation. But the unconscious is dynamic and it appears to have a kind of sentience all of its own. It's capable of independence action. So when we speak about consciousness, then we, we would have to find a way of defining what that is. And that's obviously a difficult philosophical problem. But we're more concerned with the clinical issues that come about from a consideration of what consciousness is. Because when we work with real people who aren't philosophers and who are suffering in an everyday sense simply to live their life, then issues like that become really, really important. What part of their experience can they be aware of and how can they improve the movement of energy and information around the context that is their lived life? Now that's set against the issues uh, to do, the philosophical issues to do with the different schools of psychotherapy made it absolutely necessary that we understand as far as we could what was going on. Now, those people who are familiar with um, our work with Professor George Engel and with the Dialectics of Biology group will see the etiology to this, why it was absolutely necessary that eventually we would reach this conclusion. And um, the work of Roger Penrose, Stuart Hammeroff, other field theorists, including Rupert Sheldrake, all of whom have been very influential on our work over the years, have also brought this into sharp relief that essentially we're dealing with a, a phenomenon that is a kind of organized complexity that collapses itself into a representational system, representational for us when we try to describe what that system is. Hence, this talk of a conscious and an unconscious. Um, Pierre Jeanne talked of a subconscious, but these are all states, energetic and informational states. And uh, when it comes to clinical work, we find that people are in a very collapsed state with respect to their consciousness and their awareness of themselves. But they have symptoms which they don't readily psychologically identify with the somatic, physical symptoms in the body, disturbances of behavior and relationships in the environment, a sense of continuity over time about their life up until that point. And then an intuitive, instinctive understanding of how their life should go from that moment forward into the future. So the, the temporal or time dimension is also present, both as an apperception of the past and a precognition or anticipation of the future. All of this is information that's held in different representational states, representational in the sense of being consciously aware of them. And it became really clear that the problem was what deaf psychologists call unconsciousness not being aware of why something takes a specific form. And the work of Rossi then helped us to understand how information transduces from social relationships into psychology and into the body through definite real physical pathways. And a lot of people interpreted that as psychological interpretation of biology to the extent of it being a biological reductionism. It's not that at all. They just don't fundamentally understand they're imposing a collapsed model of their own onto that. And we saw this and that was interesting too. It's like, well, why do people do this? Why do they start to look for biological reductionism? And people like Rossi are not biological reductionists. What they're talking about is the simultaneous representation of information in different states. So something that is physiological at one level of analysis, description and explanation is also psychological at another at the same time. So it's not dualistic. It's tending towards a monistic or a monist perspective. And the same is when we extend that out into the environment and we look at our behavior and we look at the effects of other people upon us. And it became really clear to us then that something like a neurosis is in several simultaneous states. It's the same information, but it collapses into representation at one or more of these levels. Once we got that, 
it all started to become clear about how we can solve a great deal of problems, including how do we communicate with the so-called unconscious, which is not unconscious, it's simply a non-ego consciousness form of information, which is dynamic and acts under its own direction, which Jung would agree with, but it's also deeply rooted within biology and deeply rooted within fields, morphogenetic fields, platonic style fields, the, the likes of Penrose and Hameroff, that, that, as deep as that. So once we got that, we began to treat people as if they were in several different states simultaneously, and their consciousness as such was. But their consciousness is not reducible as a psychological reductionism that should be described in uh, language, which is a psychologism in and of itself, to simply the ego. So we have to then say, how would the unconscious communicate if we simply allowed it to without us interpreting what that is all sorts of things began to open up then and we were able to reach people in, in very different and very effective ways so in broad terms that's it and that's why it's not dualism it's not a form of reductionism it, it's a, a perspective of the, the flow of information from different states of complexity and representation but they're not it's not locked within state we're aware of some things but still in those other states simultaneously and this helps to explain parapsychological phenomena as well. So it's a very powerful basis from which to move forwards. Mm -hmm. Well, one, one of the important parts I think in that is de facto in the informational monism model is the idea that there are other forms of consciousness outside of ego consciousness and they have to be taken into account. Yeah. So some of the more philosophical uh, quandaries, I guess, over the last, who knows how many thousands of years, um, are, are most definitely usually from an, very much an ego perspective. But your, your model seems to, to suggest here then that this superpositioning of, of the information has within it, of course, there will be a true unconscious, we can say, you know, things that just have no form of consciousness at all. Then there's the ego, but then there's a relative, what we could call consciousness in between, if, that, if that's accurate. Yeah, I'm glad you've, you've, um, you've raised superpositioning because that is actually essentially what we see. We see the same information represented differently. But if we think of it as a field which is capable of local collapse into a specific representational state, which is biological, psychological, social, field, all at the same time, what we, we get in effect is a waveform. And this is not the wave function within quantum mechanics. This is the waveform of superpositioned information that is available for us to engage with if we know what we're doing. And if we don't, what we do then is we get desiccated boxes. So we have to apply biology to one set of these nested boxes, mm -hmm. psychology to another and so forth. And the picture breaks down. And if we only approach something from the level of the ego, there's a, there's a tendency then to psychologize and to philosophize as well, because those two outcomes of a, an analysis of the, com the complete concept of a human being make that kind of reductionism, psychological reductionism or philosophical reductionism, inevitable if we're focusing only on the level of our reflexive awareness and understanding. That's the trap of being a psychological reductionist. But if we work with real people, we, we find that there is no psychology without biology at the same time, and neither of them exist outside of a social or a natural environmental context. And we have a genome. The genome is, is the record to some extent of the past, the evolutionary past. It's, it's the place where memory is stored collectively at one level of resolution. And it seems that when the genome unpacks itself over lifespan development, then there's a field phenomenon that's correlated with it. So it's not as if the genome and the field are actually locked together, but there is certainly a correlation that suggests there's another level of organization that means that they work together. And that moves all the way up. So by the time you get to the brain mind problem, it's not a problem at all. They're both kinds of collapsed state that actually have to occur together, but not just in time. And this is where parapsychology comes in and gets really interesting. And when you work in depth with depth psychology, you see this. You see retrocognition from the future in the form of synchronicities, for example. You also, uh, sorry, um, 
precognition, but you also get retrocognition of the past, which is really interesting, where ancestral memory comes from, or some kind of organized representation of information available when we access it properly to help us in the present for the future. As if all of those states simultaneously exist, but where do we put our analysis? Where do we define ourselves as being conscious? And I don't mean ego consciousness, because there are qualitative differences between these levels that actually define those levels when we are reductive about them. This is the collapse problem when we collapse the waveform. Mm -hmm. This way of modeling things, I think I said it in the last video as well, has really, really helped me because um, if, 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 modeling from a philosophical or from a scientific point of view, I think, I think, I think you can see around us anyway, the, the state of the fields anyway, um, that the, um, having a meta conscious moment, James, something just came in and smacked it out of my head. It's an important point. It will come back. State of the fields. It's the state of the, it's literally like, you know, like the complex comes in during a therapy thing and knocks it out. It's literally like yeah, that. That's instincts coming in like that too. And that's an interesting point because it's not just complexes that interfere with the ego. There's also when the bandwidth is so huge, the middle number cannot contain it. And this is why we get symbols, mm -hmm. compressed files. But sometimes the, the symbol making process is bypassed by the intensity of momentary connection with something on the scale of a meta instinct. And if it's a big enough one, we simply cannot process it. And it, it will just power through like a flash. If we're lucky, we'll catch an impression internally of what that is. That then gives us something to attempt to access again later so it's not just complexes but psychodynamic theorists freudians jungians whoever they tend to believe it's something like that it's a defense mechanism sometimes it isn't it's just the informational loading is just too high the bandwidth you know, of the ego is not sufficient you know we, we can't load it we cannot load the file immediately but we might get a flash of what that might be and that's good because that gives us something to work with Mm -hmm. It's interesting because it's right on topic of what I had forgotten that the, the philosophical and scientific traditions would either completely embrace uh, a hypothesis or a reasoning that these fields or synchronicities or precognitions exist, or they would just automatically exclude them because there's no mechanism through which to explain them, both of which because philosophy and science, typically speaking, and I think that this is fair to say, takes on the position of the ego because yes. why would you know why why wouldn't it that's that's the state of the of those particular fields yeah. but it's really interesting that working clinically seems to have automatically addressed a lot of the problems that that plague those fields from my point of view anyway um because the modeling the world as an informational monism uh, well through the informational monism model and then the biopsychosocial approach to sort of give that a context that allows the existence of things that might exists mechanically in a sound manner but only if we can adopt the position of something that's not the ego in other words our perceptions automatically constrain what we see which has enormous clinical implications but i i, I just found that interesting um, yeah, so it also it also echoes from plato as well which i'd like to ask you about in a moment but yeah yeah thank you I, i'm uh, and i'm glad you've raised that because clinical work is a living laboratory of the human soul as Jung would understand it because when we see how things are going wrong and then how they're put right again, we do understand what those workings are. Whereas if you get a relatively stable academic, stable in the sense that there's no great environmental loading on them that, and they're not physically, psychologically or psychosocially disturbed, that they're comfortable, then they tend to collapse into familiarity. And then the ideas that they have, even James Braid would have understood this, Mesmer would have understood this, become fixed ideas, they induce an altered state, but a collapsed state of attention and consciousness and people operate within that. And then we know the limitations immediately. I mean, I've always said, when I say always, I'm talking about the past 30, 40 years, said that I, I can pretty much tell the level of development of someone very, very quickly with respect to insight, because people always give it away. And once a person collapses into an academic way of doing things i know the limitations and i know that they will not be able to help people who are distressed right across right across the bandwidth and i've met plenty of people who are not academic who have no formal education but have trained as therapists 
the fallen and I, the most unpromising people on the surface by all psychosocial and cultural value, who have been excellent therapists, brilliant because they've been able to feel into that bandwidth and, and assess the waveform, what its amplitude is, what the wavelength is of that as a field phenomenon and you see these people then the, the, these people without formal education being updated from somewhere they suddenly become as good as an academic and, and a number of them have gone on to be academics actually but they would never have been judged as having the intelligence or the aptitude to be able to do so but once they're attuned to that waveform their own potential comes out and they start to make discoveries on a personal level and on an interpersonal level that's locked away from those people who have never been in that kind of environment and worked in depth but it's fascinating to see what happens when waveforms start to get attuned it is it is it's interesting when you mentioned about the fixed idea as well because um even looking at the the history of how philosophy and science developed they were never supposed to be a be-all end-all encapsulation of what everything is you know, there, there, there've always been big questions that people have asked and people have sought the answers out for it. But the methods, the, the reason, the scientific method, originally the Baconian method, of course, they were developed as tools for a specific reason, but they don't work face-to-face -face with somebody else. And on the flip side, working face-to-face -face with somebody else can help inform the questions that those other modalities are not so equipped for. I think that makes perfect sense. And it's, it's, and it's nice. It's what people see as, 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 as well. You know, the idea of human potential in general across the board human potential being the apex standard for which someone can not judge necessarily someone else by but look for in somebody else makes far more sense to me than something like iq or general metrics of intelligence which is pushed out online a lot these days as a kind of covert form of elitism but it's not really it's more ardler concealing freud i think yeah, it is. It's, a lot of it's overcompensated inferiority in other aspects of their lives. And it, it tends to be academics who've benefited from that collapsed state mm -hmm. uh, where that they issue, uh, administer and take and surpass others in intelligent quotients uh, tests to push them. Um, but I would always say, how do they relate? Mm -hmm. I, I judge people on how they relate. And when I say judge, I mean assess. I don't mean make a value statement particularly about that, but I make the observation and come to a conclusion quite rapidly on how somebody relates, because the outcome of not relating properly will mean either that there's a good person with high potential, good morally, high potential in terms of their ability that they've been born with, that's been suppressed in some way, which results in an ability not to relate at the moment. But we can nurture and help them to achieve their proper potential then there are other people who are born unable to relate and that's a genetic problem it's not an issue of character and then there's a third category of people who have what we could call bad character uh, and who can't relate it unless they're manipulating others the narcissists sociopaths psychopaths in general and then there are others that fall outside of those characters or between them to some extent but relating is hugely important and um what you said before if we take the perspective of a thought experiment, and they're always suggested, a thought experiment invites you to accept an initial premise from which an argument will proceed in order to persuade somebody of an outcome so that they can be problematical. But for now, we take a thought experiment. If the genome has some kind of intentionality and intelligence, not ego cognitive intelligence, but a different mm -hmm. kind, it would have to be able to receive information about the rest of the organism and its performance and the environment and react to that. Therefore, it would have an informational representation of that performance that we could call a kind of consciousness. Therefore, it would have a view or an opinion on what we normally identify with as being us, in other words, our reflexive ego consciousness. So what does the genome think of us? What's its view? And, and how do we ask that? How do we access that? There are ways I'm suggesting that we can do this. And we can do it in, in a, a series of gradations, which involves moving a normal ego consciousness outside of its comfort zone and down into the level where information transduces naturally between these levels. Uh, and that can bring around or bring about change very quickly and very, very profoundly. But to return again to what I, what I was saying, 
the genome's impression of us would be very interesting if we could find out what that would be. Mm -hmm. Are we messing up? Are we cocking this up? Are, are, are we you know, fulfilling our potential? What does it think of us? What does it see when it looks at us? Um, and that's where, where the potential lies at that level. Mm -hmm. Once we contact it, there appear to be field phenomena which are lateral simply to the biology of the genome and are temporally removed from it forwards and backwards, which all line up and generate a whole situation within which information moves in the form, for example, of synchronicities or the trickster as a regulatory function. Now we call it the trickster, we give it a reified uh, frame, you know, uh, the kind of thing that we put on the card, for example, to, to portray it. These are reifications of something which is actually a natural function. And then there's the, the, the future potential, which is locked within the genome, the anticipation of an optimal adaptation, given a proper chance. All of that's present, all of it is active, simultaneously held in different representational forms, and we are aware, in an ego sense, of a small part of it. And that's why we suffer. That's why we become neurotic. Mm -hmm. Every, I love the fact that everything you said is so phylogenetically sound, which is something I don't often see with, um, for just for example, the more classical Jungian types, when they talk about what's close, they, they don't usually use the word genome, but things that are deeper in the unconscious, that may be orchestrating things in the, in the background. To, to go to that idea of the genome then, um, to, and then, you know, Professor Mark Solms talks about this, for example, that we've evolved an ego for adaptation to the outside world. So immediately that's within a Darwinian context straight away. OK, yeah, yeah. then in which case the capacity of the ego to dissociate. So this would be an original discovery, I believe, from Pierre Janet, um, That must also there serve if we if we take a phylogenetic approach that must therefore also serve adaptation. And it's like, OK, so we've got sort of Darwinism, if you like. With no, with no social connotations around that happening in real time in the individual's life. But if they stray too far outside of homeostasis, what you're suggesting then is that the genome is there as the sum total successful, and it would have to be because everyone's bred successfully, basically, the sum total success of everyone's ancestors going all the way back, probably even pre homo sapiens as well, in terms of that ancestral memory, Definitely. not as, as a literal. Um, mystical spirit sort of hanging over the genome that might be an image that initially comes to mind but as you were suggesting it's a different form of consciousness that's non-ego it's yeah. like that's simply what the genome does because it has to that's what it's been harnessed to do i really like that model it's so evolutionarily sound yeah thank you james uh, that's very well explicated yeah i'd agree with mark solms and uh, yak punk said that that's the likely uh, purpose of the evolution initially of the human ego and you would then see traits characteristic structures including brain structures uh, of previous iterations of that lineage as you say before it was human so the panksepian instincts are shared with other animals who have to have similar brain structures uh, and also insofar as we have a similar enough genome to produce that all, all of that's the case the thing is though that well, not only that, we do have to explain why we have such an enlarged cerebral cortex, the cerebrum, both cerebral hemispheres, why they are as large as they are and as adapted as they are. There should be a psychological concomitant to that, which is anticipated in the genome and I'm suggesting in the Sheldrake in morphogenetic fields and in the uh, Penrose Hameroff platonic field and any kind of iteration of those two and how they would interact together with the genome. So, yeah, it's, it's not a direct um, ancestral memory as a conscious ego memory or recall of a personal timeline. But what it is, is information. Information and a drive to adapt and to optimise with a, a, a bandwidth of capacity. And we have a huge bandwidth of capacity. And that's the answer to why we have this enlarged cerebral cortex. But there is something that's evolved with that clearly and this is where i think it gets really interesting that there are patterns of adaptation that are social that are uniquely human that are not present in other species mm -hmm. if the cortex um although it is effectively blank in some senses when it when we're first born 
wasn't capable of receiving information to be uploaded from within or from without with respect to a field. If it wasn't capable of that, we would have to learn everything, really learn every single thing and associate that together. And that would take a tremendous amount of effort if there were no templates that were existing. And this is what, of course, the Jungians call archetypes. And as you said in the last video, they've, they've been at great pains to try to separate the idea of archetype from instinct. And Jung never really quite managed it. If you take every account that he ever gave of instincts compared to archetypes, he never really managed to separate them. And my view is because they, you cannot separate them because what he called archetypes were instincts, but they were not the kind of instinct that he was looking at, which was more of the Panksepian one. So again, what I'm saying is there are other kinds of instincts which we could call archetypes, but I don't think that's helpful, which we call meta instincts, that is to say, after the Panksepian ones, which are solely human. Uh, they're connected to the genome insofar as the genome contributes to them, but they're also related to fields as well. And this is where we get our capacity for foresight beyond our immediate experience. So the Panksepian instincts do anticipate a state, as Marx says, and the, the primary evolutionary role seems to have been to extend homeostasis outside of the body's capacity to deal with it internally. So it goes into behavior in the environment. But in a social animal like human beings and some of the whales, um, killer whales, orcas, for example, have uh, very, very, um, very, very structured cortexes. They've got more gyri than we have, more bumps apparently than we have, even in human brains, very sophisticated language, they have culture, they have all of this as well. So they won't be limited to Panksepian instincts either, and a lot of that is going to be innate and anticipated and projected forward in time. So we have social instincts in effect, and they are arranged according to the anticipation of lifespan development, so they become narratives, they become scenarios. The scenario of the meta instinct can collapse and it can expand dynamically according to optimal adaptation. It can. But if we have a suboptimal adaptation, so the meta instinct is only partially fulfilled, the rest of that information is still present and it may still push, which gives us the impetus to adapt psychosocially, to be creative, um, to generate culture, uh, to be inventive according to the bandwidth which is still present regardless of how much of that we have actualized and also the meta instinct provides the context for the automatic deep structure panksepian ancient paleo-human and before in terms of evolutionary lineage push without them they would be aimless we would be literally animals and we are not and our cortex isn't just a blank slate it's a prepared physiological space to be filled by experience. And it's prepared by the genome and probably by fields. Uh, and within the genome, there will be these meta instincts which boot up the, the, the categories of understanding and experience that we're going to have, which sounds a bit Kantian, uh, but it's not reduced into that. This is back into the context of biology, um, field theory, but also into depth psychology. Because when we work with human beings in depth, everything it opens out. Jung was right about the, the evolutionary psyche. He was absolutely right about that. The human mind, so-called, is archaeological. It is anthropological. It is paleoanthropological. It is layered upon layer upon layer, and we can access it. And that's where the Jungians got it wrong, because they produced this thing they called the psychoid boundary and said that you, you can only take psychology so far. Well, that's the limitation that the ago can put on itself by expecting psychology to be only a version of the ego projected internally. It isn't like that when you take an informational monism perspective, because everything lines up. The same information's there, but it collapses into a state. And then some of that information goes up and opens out on another level, and it's all at the same time. But only a portion of that will be available to consciousness, ego consciousness. And as you say about philosophy, when it generates an egocentric position and collapses into itself, it cannot access this other material because it can't move outside of itself. It can't imagine being outside of itself. It can fantasize about it, but there's a difference between fantasy and imagination, I'd suggest, that is worth discussing and worth bearing in mind when we work with imagery and when we work with other people clinically.
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To go back to what you're saying about brain sizes for, for a moment, because I was thinking about this really recently, because it's, 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 it's very interesting. We, we grew enormous brains enormously quickly, which is a bit of an evolutionary mystery. And no one really knows why that's the case. One of the most popular hypotheses, of course, is that we discovered cooking and fire. But we've not, we've not found fire sites or campsites that are that old. So there's, there's got to be something that helped fuel it. The fact it was so quick to me, just as a quick aside, suggests it's probably multifactorial. You know, there's definitely going to be a huge element of sexual selection in there, for example. But it's interesting what, what you're saying, because it seems to, to say that what we were being selected for at that period of time was meta instincts, essentially, yeah. rather than because we normally think of with big brain and the more cognitive neuroscience senses, this particular person is very intelligent. They can make a bigger tool than somebody else, etc. But the suggestion here seems to be that the environment and the genome are like co-adapting to each other. And I mean that literally, really, because that's how the meta instincts work. Yeah, I can, can I just say that that is very interesting because that that is supported by the idea of the superpositioning of information in informational monism. Mm -hmm. But we, we collapse into a perspective which says there's the genome and that's it. And there's the environment and, that, and that's it. That, you know, nature, nurture, all these old, tired, ridiculous, reductive, collapsed arguments that have been around for decades. And dare I say it, this so-called mind-brain problem, um, you know, the hard problem of consciousness is probably a product of the way that the approach is made to the observation of human nature. In other words, we collapse into that and then it justifies itself within its framework of observation. But I honestly believe the people who have enough experience of working in depth and, and that they see how information moves, you know, and, and you know this because you've experienced it. And, and the more so since you've been connected with us that, that this has been kicked off. And uh, I, I think this is part of the proof of concept of, of, of this kind of thing is that when you, get, you, you work in depth with, with someone, so-called parapsychological, paranormal, weird informational things occur. Oh, yeah. Why is that? You know, if they didn't occur before or not in the same way, why does that happen? And it does happen. It's demonstrable and it's real. But if you have a collapsed ego, you tend not to experience it. It's the skeptic phenomenon in parapsychology. It's well known. If somebody has a skeptical attitude, then the experiments don't produce a result. Uh, and they live with that polarity that the skeptics have in parapsychology. A lot of parapsychologists are skeptics for some reason. They, they like to do that. Whereas I would rather say what's actually happening and, and why do we form this polarity and say, I believe, I disbelieve. Because that's a neurotic position to take. We should just say, well, what's happening? And it might be, I don't know, or make another observation. But don't collapse your observation. You're dealing with a very complicated broadband phenomenon with this waveform of superpositioned information and it's moving around all the time. But only people who work in depth psychology ever see this. And philosophers don't, there aren't any clinical philosophers. That's not how they operate. So they don't see it. So that, that's what I'm, I'm trying to get across here is that our approach to the phenomenon depends how we collapse our perceptions. And once they are collapsed, that's it. It becomes a habit. Mm -hmm. I, I always thought to myself that the true scientific attitude would not be to automatically exclude anything. And it surprises me, or it did, it did anyway for a while, as to why scientists wouldn't want to do that usually. For, for example, if you were to put the average scientist, biologist, chemist, physicist, and posit the idea of parapsychology, synchronicity, fields, anything like that, you'd probably be laughed out of the room. That, that used to really bother me. But scientists are just as um, prone to falling over their own psychology as anybody else. Yeah. That, that, that helped an awful lot with that, to say that there's a reason that's not the scientific method for you discounting this stuff in this way. So I'm, I'm much more on, on side with the forensic approach for yourself and Pauline has taught me, because it doesn't accept things without evidence. It still demands evidence. Mm -hmm. Um, but just because a mechanic isn't known per se, like it would be in science, or you can't run a controlled experiment, doesn't mean that you should exclude it. You can't run a controlled experiment with the psyche. Like academic psychologists try to, but they come up with statistics. Mm 
yeah. which is not which is not the same thing. They're correlations, and no one's a correlation. No one's a, st a statistic. So it's not science. I'll call Young in on this. That's numerology, the superstitious belief in the power of numbers. Statistics is that, to some extent, when you uh, start to engage with really fundamental issues, human issues like this. Um, can, can I offer a, a possible reason why uh, skepticism is necessary, actually? And, and mm -hmm. this, this goes back to what's the difference, as I define it anyway, as a working sort of model between uh, imagination and fantasy. Einstein approved of imagination, he said it was more important than thinking, and he was an imaginative thinker. Um, Freud didn't like fantasy, he thought it was pathological. I think they're both right, and that's the difference. Imagination is something which delivers meta instinct and potential to us. Fantasy, though, is not like that. That, that is the utilization to generate a holding space, a virtual holding space for something that can't be acted out in the world, but then overextends itself and becomes a replacement for reality and it becomes maladaptive. So the, the way to prevent imagination becoming fantasy is to reduce into a hard science model and insist on that. Your progress is slower and it's narrower, but you do stop flights of fantasy. And one of the problems with exploring depth psychology and Jungians fall for this all the time is that they, they fall into the trap of fantasy, ego fictions, neurotic alibis, grand narrative projections and internalizations, all of that stuff. Uh, inflation basically, and collapse around a nuclear idea or, or nested group of ideas that support them staying in that state for all sorts of reasons, as you said before, including Adlerian uh, reasons. So I think that, that that's why the scientific model is, is still useful, oh, yeah. but only, only if you can move out of it as well. And when you mention forensics, that's how we model forensics. That is to say that, yes, we, we, we're interested in science and we support it, but if it doesn't explain something, that means there's something wrong with the approach. So the approach has to be adjusted. Um, it, it might mean that the, the scientific method uh, or the, 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 the technical side of it very often isn't up to the job, but that doesn't mean that we don't look. Uh, and, and forensics is something that's linked very much to the, the seeking system. In a pan-sepian sense, it's a, it's a very ancient way of feeling driven to understand a situation. And as soon as I said the word situation, I've moved beyond pan and we're into the messer instincts now, because a situation is a scenario. And if, if you are forensically minded then, and you're driven initially by your seeking system to, to find the solution, you have to have the context for that. And if you're investigating a complicated situation involving human beings, uh, where something has happened and evidence is being hidden, that kind of thing. You have to understand the context and make intuitive guesses sometimes as, as generating hypotheses. This is imagination here and not fantasy. And then test that. And this is where the scientific side of things come in. You test your hypotheses. You generate them, though. You have to. You have to understand the context. And this is the pressure testing of doing it. And you can find yourself making gains Whereas if we were too psycho reductive in a scientific statistical sense, we get nowhere. And that's what we see happening with people who are like that. So the forensic method uses science, but is not limited to it. It certainly would move away from a philosophical reductionism where the ego collapses around its own capacity to generate fanciful ideas, mm -hmm. fanciful philosophical ideas. The ideas in and of themselves can generate the fantasy of, of a solution when they're locked in state. But there are no clinical philosophers because philosophy cannot solve these kinds of problems. It started out in Greece as an attempt to do that. And I think the spirit was wonderful. But our philosophy today is very different from Greek philosophy. Greek philosophy, had it moved forward and evolved, would have been very different. And I agree with Jung, it would be very similar to depth psychology had that happened. Mm -hmm. But what passes for philosophy now, as he said, is in a lamentable state. It's the same with our science when it comes to the phenomenon of the human condition. But if we meet people on, on their own terms, it's not just the surface, everything's present. And when their field, their overall complete situation resonates with the fact that you know this about them and you're in resonant contact 
with them and with it, with their wider context, things happen that don't happen for therapists who stay on the surface or who are statistical, clinical psychologists of an academic uh, orientation. It's a different world. It's completely different. And after a while, um, parapsychological phenomena just become normal because they're happening anyway, but we're not aware of them because we're, we're locked in state. And that means the unconscious is forced, to, uh, so-called unconscious is forced to overcompensate for our collapsed consciousness, ego consciousness, and it generates neuroses. It generates issues in the environment. It generates the trickster. It, it generates somatic symptoms. It generates all sorts of things start to go wrong because we're in a collapsed state, but the information is there and informational pressure is huge, massive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really, really like all of that. I really like it. Just, just to touch on science again for one, one moment, there, and to defend science as well, if you, were to, if you wanted to find out what one gene does in the human genome, you have to use science for that. You normally take gene, you transform it into a plasmid, um, or you, you, you put it into a plasmid, you transform it into a bacteria or a yeast, then you have another cell which doesn't have that. You vary the environment and you watch to see what the differences are. Because you've controlled one variable, you can put it down to, well, beyond a shadow of a doubt, probably, more than likely, all the differences are due to that one particular gene. Then if you run a million different tests, you're being forensic at that point with modeling really rather than scientific. But if you run a million different tests, that's the scientific method. You can't, I really don't think you can do that with the psyche. How do you take one person, clone them, and then change one variable? You, you can't do it. Or even take two people and say, well, they're kind of different in this particular way, like one variable difference. It's not. It's, it either becomes a statistical game straight away, or it becomes a statistical game masked by epidemiology, which is just the same thing. You know, statistical trends within a population. It's how you get stuff like the big five personality test, where someone is a number, and they're a, a number from zero to 100 of how neurotic they are. And they say things like, well, these personality traits remain stable over the lifespan. Therefore, they're going to be stable. So complexes explain that too, because most people don't get rid of their complexes. You know, so where's the real science being done here? But yeah, yeah. So, so the I like what you said there. You 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 can do science. Science is great, but if you can move beyond it, that echoes back to what you were saying earlier that you're allowing the full bandwidth of one's own potential to come out yeah. the full personality and also be receptive to that from other people yeah. because 99 percent of a scientist's life is not scientific and probably a bit less we'll say that 80 percent of a philosopher's life is not philosophical where's the science in immediately or where's the philosophy in one-on-one -on -one relating every day it's not there which means there has to be something else that's not science or philosophy yeah both of them are, are collapsed models of representation of the world and of the human condition and of relating. You know, philosophy is uh, in whatever form it takes because it's not one thing, just like psychology, psychotherapy schools are not one thing. They're, they're different. They're very, very different across the bandwidth. They're as different within their level as they are between themselves and other levels. There's a huge difference. It's almost a, a false uh, category, really, to talk about psychotherapy schools or models. And because, as Jung observed, we're working with the personality. It's more than only that, but working with the personality, that confounds everything as well. Um, Jung psychology is him, as he was. And he's, if, if people read enough into his background, they'll see that. Uh, it, it's, it's only that. Uh, it's the same with Freud. It's the same with most of them because they were powered from within to optimise themselves and to actualize, which meant that the, their character and their personality got behind that or was pushed from behind by it, however we want to model that. The outcome is the same, though, that the, the, the product is a representation of them and that has the colouring of their individual character and personality attached to it, including its limitations. Um, an advantage of this biopsychosocial systems model and informational monism, amongst many others, is that it forces you to step outside of yourself, but not in a reductive way, but in an inclusive way. That's the difference. You know, objectivity is a goal uh, and is a virtue. Uh, obviously, 
often means that, that we actually lose something of our humanity. Hence, we get these statistical proofs of academic psychology, which are pretty much beside the point when it comes to real life and real people. That that's an attempt at being objective, which is actually a collapsed state. Uh, and a lot of academic psychologists are very uncomfortable about that, but they're too comfortable in other ways to change it. So they sit in this neurotic state of trying to prove themselves to be scientists in a biological way about something which is only statistical and they feel awful on the inside because they're not actualizing themselves or really understanding human nature. So this is another reason why we, we uh, utilize altered states of consciousness and hypnosis to the extent that we do. Uh, you mentioned Pierre Janet before. He was, I think, the, the hallmark of understanding dissociation. We can move on from him. We, we, we don't need to remain where he was at, but his contribution historically was huge. But there were others. There was the Nancy School in France, Hippolyte like Bernheim, for example. Um, there was James Braid, and there were others as well, and Mesmer, uh, who all understood to some extent what dissociation was and how consciousness did split in that way. But he organized this in a way which was liberating Jeanne. Um, and immediately that Jeanne's teaching was received by someone like Carl Jung. It was taken so far and then it collapsed into Carl Jung's personality and his interests and his trajectory personally under pressure from within himself to do the thing that, that he coined as being individuation. He was completely authentic in that sense that he did individuate. Carl Jung became who Carl Jung was intended to be and should be with all of his capabilities and all of his limitations. And it was a statement about a life lived authentically but it's an individual life and there are many, many obvious alternatives to that and necessary ones for other people to make other contributions. So when we understand the complete situation, we have to take all of these factors into account. And on the surface, that's overwhelming. But there is or there are deeper structures that we can access. And again, I'm getting back to the importance of hypnosis here, that altered states of consciousness, ego consciousness, when we alter that, we access other levels of simultaneous consciousness that are present anyway and can facilitate the movements of information within the system as a whole. So what is called unconscious is no longer unconscious. We experience it from what it is according to how it represents itself. That is incredible when you get that experience. It's very, very different from internally projecting a model that we borrowed from, from somebody else and say, oh, there's the anima, there's the shadow, or there's the id, or, whatever, or the Oedipus complex, wherever it might be. If, if we start from the presumption there's no such thing outside of the individual collapsed state of the personalities of the founders of those methods, but we say, what does the unconscious so-called want to say? What's the genome's view of us? Oh, you ask, you ask in the right way, you'll get an answer and it comes from within. And that is a very, very different, as I say, very, very different experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Do you, do you mind if I ask a more um, metaphysical question just, just for a moment? Sure. Sweet. So um, I'm, I'm very interested in this. So yourself and Pauline um, derived, I would I'd say, the informational monism approach from clinical work. Yeah. It clearly at least from my perceptions anyway, has strong similarities with the platonic intuition of the world of forms. Yeah. Um, and if, if anyone watching this is not overly familiar, essentially the, the world and everything that we see with our eyes, the material world is an imperfect representation of something that is perfect. Perfect in a way that um, can, be, can be explained, I guess, in Kantian terms, but something abstract, essentially. So your, your, your derivation there reminds you of the platonic intuition. Mm -hmm. And then to bring in Sir Roger Penrose into this and his work um, or his interpretation of Gödel's incompleteness theorem, et cetera, where, he's, where he speaks about how maths is the equivalent of that original platonic dialectic. I'm wondering if you had any thoughts on the potential relationship between the information in your model, the world of forms, and Sir Roger Penrose's maths being a part of that. In other, and I say it's metaphysical because yeah, as, we, yeah. as we go down that biopsychosocial stack, yeah. where does it bottom out? Yeah, thank you for that. I, 
with respect to metaphysics, I think, um, although that's the term that we're using, um, I don't think it's helpful. And this is not a criticism of the question, uh, as you've, you've stated it, because we have to have these terms in order to engage with them. I, I would say that the implications of, of Roger Penrose's model uh, and even of informational monism as we practice it and have practiced it, is that there's no such thing. You know, and Carl Jung's idea of honest mundus would suggest there's no such thing. The, the, these are collapsed states of information that are in a state of complexity. And at one level, that becomes what we call matter, tangible baryonic matter. Um, and at another level of resolution, it's not that. But the, the level of resolution describes a complexity of a system or systems, but they do communicate with one another, which means that they have an understanding of a kind of the next level up and of those below. So each level anticipates that which is above and that which is below, not just directly, but also upstream and also very downstream in terms of how things are arranged. So for me, there is no metaphysics except that we collapse into that in order to make a distinction between you know hard science and how far that can go and then philosophical speculation about something else when it comes to plato i i feel and beyond feeling going into the, the level of meaning i i always have since i was first exposed to plato's ideas that his intuition was profound and um his method his dialectic his, his method of accessing what he called the forms was the absolute best that was available at the time. And it's still useful. It, it, it's, it's within that stack of the capacity to be conscious as a human being of what is likely to be going on. And then with respect to Roger Penrose's work, I, I, I think he is in that tradition, but he's not a reductionist. You know, he's not. Uh, um, I, th I think the implications of his work are within potential grasp, but this is this is the the issue, and this is where Carl Jung actually does come in. You know, when, when Jung was in one of his more sane moments, um, of, of many, I might add, but but specifically this, that the, the psyche is the only thing we appear to have that that can validate its own existence reflexively, according to consciousness as we understand it in in, in, uh, in a sense. So therefore. We will have intuitions which are based on information which is not like us, which is not ego consciousness, and it will be represented in, a, in the form of a symbol. And beneath that, Penrose comes and says, in the form of mathematics, mathematical laws, uh, and so mm -hmm. forth. They're both snapshots of processes which can be joined together without contradiction, in my view, if we take an informational monism perspective and we think about complexity of arrangements or, or, or systems of communication. Um, so Jung is right that we are stuck with the idea of we have to be able to perceive, apperceive and intuit. But I think he's wrong at the point where he says there is a boundary beyond which we cannot go. I think that's too much of a limit. The boundary is generated by an ego which imagines itself only to be psychology and only to be ego conscious psychology, even where the ego has a model of what it calls the unconscious. Because it's already split, it's uh, that is unconscious, so I can't go there. And at a certain point, it's biology, it's crossed the psychology boundary. Well, Rossi showed us that it is only information that moves around. What we're suggesting is that information is organized and present, whether we're aware of it or not. And that's the key. So the boundaries become a product of our capacity to perceive, but it's still there. If we accept that, suddenly things start to open up. And I think we can join Penrose with Jung and we can join, uh, join up uh, Jung with a more forensic approach and we can join up, uh, Jung with biology as well and see no contradiction between the flow and representation of information. And the proof of this, in my view for sure, is working with people who are in a state of distress with respect to their lifespan development adaptation to the world because everything's there in the room with you. It's, not only is their personal history present, their, their genetic history is present, their ancestral history is present, the anticipation of the future is present. It's all there, it's all in the room. It's a very crowded place.
And what do we do? You know, our, our agro can't process, it's too big, it's a massive bandwidth. So what we need to do is to collapse into an appropriate state, which will open out the other end. And then we receive a, con a contracted package of information, which opens out inside our so-called unconscious. It's not only in the unconscious, it opens out into our biology, our genome responds to it, our fields respond to it. And uh, the perfect method of doing this interpersonally in hypnosis or altered states of consciousness is the use of metaphor. Metaphor is big. A really good hypnotist will communicate metaphor and it appears not to be. It, it appears to be something that you can absorb. You listen to it. The ego receives it and suddenly it expands and it gets too big, too big for the ego to process it within the middle number. And immediately the, the self-concept and all of our identified complexes try to make sense of this thing, which is opening out, opening out, opening out. And then it reaches the point of saturation there and they can't deal with it anymore. And then it goes right back, right in, and it's met by something from the other side, which are the meta instincts, behind which are pansapian and the genome and the field. And they say, yeah, got it. I understand what's contained in the metaphor. So the metaphor opens out, it's received, lock and key, and then the person changes and they don't know why they've changed. The ego doesn't know why it's changed, but everything else agrees with the change, which is implied by the metaphor. The also states of consciousness is necessary to bypass the ego and to bypass its complexes. And the technicalities of how that happens would need quite a bit of exp explication. We do that in the training courses, obviously, uh, uh, as you, you guys know, uh, within IPSA. But that's fundamentally how it works. And that is why dreams appear to be narrative based and is why we are interested in the cultural representation of narratives in the form of myths, movies, novels and so forth. These are very high bandwidth pieces of information. But if we treat these things culturally as fantasies because we're not acting out the imperative that's coming from the genome via the meta instincts, then all we do is create this space to jump into and to hide from the world and not act out. That does not solve the instinctive pressure. It relieves it, but we have to have more fantasy, more fantasy, more fantasy. Whereas imagination is different because imagination is the fulfillment, the movements of potential, our energy and information moves out into the environment when we become continuous, everything agrees and lines up. And then we move on. We're no longer in fantasy. It's worked. And that's the solution to neurosis. Imagination and fantasy would be a wonderful one to talk with you about genuinely as well. It's, it's a good topic. I do see them as being different. Mm. Imagination has an imperative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Im Im imagination is innately creative, yeah. whereas fantasy is not. Fantasy, can, fantasy can, be, can be useful. It can be a portal, obviously, but... Um, what was the quote about Jung that, that you said? It's like the psyche can only validate itself. Yeah, in, in other words, um, we, we, we don't have an objective reference point outside of that, he said. Right. So that's a kind of psycho-reductionism immediately. It's ego-psychic reductionism. It's fatalism, really. It's awful. It's to say that we, we, we can't access things outside of that. That automatically turns everything into a psychologism. Right. Sometimes when we access the the non-conscious, uh, you know what I mean by that, the unconscious, we, we don't get a little figure dialoguing with us. Uh, we get a sensation that it's very hard to put into words because it's not represented internally. It's just something else. We feel it though as a sensation rather than feel it as an affect. We can be separated from the affect, but it's still there. And it's like, oh, this is interesting. This, this, this is a different frequency of information. It's present in the background. It's probably there all the time. But I've added it to my conscious perception, but not in an ego-framed way. So it's like as he expanded his knowledge, his ego inflated with that, and everything was reduced to his ego as he expanded it. Instead of seeing a difference and a continuum, it was ego or nothing, and his ego was his point of perception of, the li of life. That was his inflation. Mm -hmm. It's... All that stuff is really interesting in the context of Penrose then, because Gödel's incompleteness theorem states and proved definitively that you, you, you cannot have a completely coherent mathematical logic ever because it cannot ever prove its own existence. Mm 
you know how Penrose has carried that on to say that therefore consciousness is non-computational, which I, you know, we know that that's absolutely the case. But I'm wondering if it's also a de facto proof for the unconscious, as defined as non-ego. That, that there absolutely has to be one thing in and of itself cannot prove its own existence. So, so basically, I bring up the maths thing there because there's our psychology. And then there's something outside of our psychology, sort of as like a. We didn't we didn't invent maths. Maths invented us. That's what I'm trying yeah. to say. Yeah. In and that's that's a collapse way of putting it. But I, I, those 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 deep questions are, are very very interesting to me. Yeah, I, I think Roger's great, but he's not. He's got no experience with deaf psychology. None. No, he's, he's a true scientist through and through, which is yeah, why he won't stray I mean, into anywhere. Fabulous, and he, he's made great, um, you know, great progress, and he, he's informed the world, and he, he's absolutely wonderful, and he's part of intellectual history, and he's absolutely necessary. But when you have to work with the reality of another human being, everything does change, unless you collapse into a, a particular way of meeting that. Mm -hmm. The, the idea that consciousness is not computational, well, what the hell is, first of all, define what consciousness is. And for me, it's the same with this hard problem. I don't think it exists. No, I think it it's doesn't. a product of the wrong kind of perception of the issue. Yeah, I don't think Psalms addressed it either. No. In the seminar, um, by reframing perception to feeling, it's like, it, it, you're, you're right, there, there is no hard problem. There is none. If, if you're going to address a hard problem, um, it's going to be addressed through an informational monism style model, which has to begin with some form of physics. But there's, a, to me, it's, there's almost an inbuilt arrogance into it, and in, you know, an, an inbuilt kind of collapse around ego perception, that just because we can't see something, it doesn't make sense to us. Therefore, it's a hard problem. And it's like, no, that makes it a fun problem. Yeah, it's a psychoid issue again. I think there's a direct parallel there between Jung's psychoid idea. Now that that. Uh, being said, um, as you know from case studies, um, with some people who uh, take anorexia or anorexia takes them to the extreme, we can model that as being a psychoid issue and that the phanatos then is a drive to catabolize to, uh, yourself uh, seems to be the case and, and psychology can't cross that boundary. Ordinary level psychology cannot cross the boundary, but why should we expect it to? Because psychology in and of itself is a collapse. It's not a wide enough form of, of contact. Um, it's extremely difficult when people are in that state because the resistance is in them to looking anywhere because they, they are literally collapsing. They're going to a point of singularity. But to say that it's because it's no longer psychological is only partially true. That, that, that says more about the limitations of our understanding or conceptualization of what the hell psychology is than anything else. There's still information in there, just like there is in a singularity. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not completely lost. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, agreed. You know, if mass was, for example, destroyed, there'd be no gravity. Would the emitted by the singularity? It would it, it just it would just go and wouldn't exist anymore. But it does exert force through gravity on pretty much everything else, including the space around it. So there, there is information in there, and there is with, with someone who's, who's heading in a in the Thanatos sense over their own events horizon into a psychoid singularity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the strongest model I've ever come across, I found. It, it, it is. I, I, I believe it is. I believe the foundation, because the proof of concept is working with other people, but you have to do it. You know, you know you've know, you worked with people. You have to do it in order to know that. Um, but the limitations come from what we superimpose between us and the other. That That's a confounding factor. Yeah. They sense it, you know, they, they, they know when you know, they sense it, which is why I say that the complexes recognize you. Mm -hmm. They do. This has all been fantastic today. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank you, Steve. I'd love to have another conversation with you soon on imagination and fantasy. Yeah. Yeah, because I think Very there's good. a huge amount in there. But I think for today, probably best we close up, I think. Okay, thank you. And thanks, everybody. Blessings all. Thanks, Steve. Take care, everyone.